Hi everyone. Today um, I'm talking to Jenny Dempsey, who has an exhibition with us in the LHQ Virtual Gallery. My name is Maeve Mulrennan. I'm the Assistant Arts Officer with Cork County Council. So welcome Jenny. It's lovely to speak to you. Um, we've never actually met in person, but it's it's lovely to see you again over Zoom. How are you? Yeah, nice to be here. Um, so your exhibition is a virtual exhibition because of the times that we're in. Um, would you like to just um, explain a little bit about the exhibition and what's in it? Okay. Um, well, the title of the exhibition is Come Down with 18th Century Me. And it's all about if you hadn't were suddenly time traveled back to 18th century Cork and you had to give a dinner party, how would you do it? Like, would you know what shops to go to? What would you wear? How would you get those clothes? Um, and how would you entertain your guests? And what would you talk about? Uh, so that's the gist of the exhibition. Mm -hmm. And the, it's, um, the reason for that was the 18th century uh, in Ireland and all of the world, um, trade and travel were kind of really booming. So people were getting exotic things from other shores. And Cork was well positioned as the last stop before the Americas. So they were getting hardwood and mahogany to make lovely furniture. And of course there was porcelain coming in from China and there was sugar and all, it, a dinner party was a perfect way to display. I'm good enough to have all this good stuff. Yeah. And how did you get interested in this topic? Have you worked in this area before? I'm a graphic designer by trade and have been doing that for many, many years. And then, you know, the way kind of different paths come together and all of a sudden it becomes, oh, this is what I'm doing next. There was a little bit of that going on. I was always interested in history and social history. I've always loved beautiful things and visiting old houses. And anytime I went there, I always used to, like the furniture was lovely and all, but I always wondered, how do they actually live? What do they mm -hmm. talk about? Or what do they do? How are they really like? And I started trying to create a kind of a guide like this by myself, maybe about six years ago. Uh, and I was inundated with facts that I was compiling and my house was covered with little post-it notes reminding me of things and I'd discover something go oh I'd forgotten about this and I had notes on notes and I, I couldn't keep track of it yeah somebody suggested that I contact the Crawford Gallery to ask if I could do it as an MA or a PhD or something uh, so I did and they said no but yes I sound like Little Britain <laughs> um, they said that they had a different project coming up and my original research was set in the Regency times and they said if I wanted to go back sometime they had a scholarship um, working conjunction with Nano Nagel Place that lovely <coughs> new museum open in Cork uh, to research life for 18th century women of which mm -hmm. Nagel was one so I was thrilled uh, and I undertook that scholarship. It was two years, I learned so much. And it was a beautiful timing for me in my career in that I'd been busy kind of doing my thing for many years and getting a bit tired of it and not learning new skills. And all of a sudden there was this injection of new knowledge and new excitement. Um, but the, the research of all of that that I did, I ended up with a lot of information about women in 18th century Cork. Uh, and then I turned it into a particular book and this exhibition. And, and the the voice in the two books and in the website, it reminds me of like a Mrs. Beacon. It's it's slightly stern and um, kind of matriarchal, but it's quite humorous as well. But it's a very, very distinctive voice that carries very consistently throughout your work. Did yeah. you arrive at that naturally or was it something that you you tried maybe a few different things or a few different angles? Um, I think it came out of uh, all the etiquette man manuals that were being produced at the time. They would have that particular tone, as you say, kind of quite instructive and that there was a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. And that was interesting as well because um, the idea of taste suddenly kind of arose around these, these times. And the problem was shopping also rose and the middle classes were coming up. So there was no differentiation between the kind of the, the high society and low society. And you had to have a differentiation. So what you bought became important. But then like anything, once the, the upper classes were buying the right things, the middle classes started producing etiquette books so they could buy the right things. So that tone was in that about how to live and how to dress and what to talk about. Excellent. Um, in one of the books, I think it's this one, 
you have the same font as the Orchie guide, which I, I really appreciate. Um, <laughs> there's there's a picture of a pineapple somewhere in it. Oh, yeah. Did you know that you could rent a pineapple for your dinner party? I know, I know mad. Yeah. yeah. I've read stories. I think it's Dorothea Herbert. She was a woman in Tipperary, I think, near Carrigan-Shore. And she was kind of saying that the, um, the pineapple was looking very saggy after day 32. It was doing the rounds <laughs> of all the families in society. Yeah. <laughs> Mad, isn't it? There was, um, there was a, a failed attempt at growing pineapples in Limerick as oh, well. Right. There was this massive big building built mm. to it. It's, um, I think it's turned into offices now or something like that. Um, That's how all um, greenhouses came about. Yeah. I yeah. Um, so you have two books. Um, show them here. And the exhibition that we have online, it's focused around the dinner party. Yeah. Um, but if you go there onto the website, you can also find out how to buy the books. And one of the things that I really love about the books first of all it's like say this one it has a lovely kind of sheen on it um but there's also these things throughout like little letters yeah um we were saying earlier on that um it's like marginalia in a, yeah. a manuscript it's like a subplot um and you've made these very very beautiful things um and they tell their own little kind of subplot throughout the book as well and there's that idea that you've you've uncovered something secret. Yes, exactly. Um, that was I trying to do, Maeve. Um, you know yourself if you buy a secondhand book or get something from it uh, and inherited from re relatives, and you find something in it, it tells you much more than the actual that they chose this book, and yeah. it's, it's much more interesting. Um, and with the MA that I was doing, uh, I studied narratology, the whole kind of science and theory behind it, which was fascinating. I've been kind of implementing it a little bit in my work, but without knowing what I was doing and to realize how it works and how the psychology of how people learn through stories was mm -hmm. really, really interesting. And there was two things I took from that that I'd like to tell you. And one of them was the inserts, this whole um, multimodal experience uh, of not just reading pages on a, word, on a a book, which a lot of history books are. Mm -hmm. So these books try to be, they're illustrative, there's different styles of illustration, and then there's these things to discover. So it's yeah. much more, you're involved in the experience of, of and that's actually also about the how-to guide that came, um, that was part of that as well in that, it, it kind of invites the reader to imagine themselves back in time. So it's again more interactive rather than they did this, they did that. This is more you would do this. Yeah. Um, and then the, the other point that I wanted to make about that was uh, about the storytelling. Um, and I've totally, oh yeah, <laughs> nearly forgotten what I was going to say. Was, uh, <clears throat> and I've forgotten it again now. That's nerves for you. <laughs> Yes, remembered it again now. Um, what I wanted to try and show also was that we're not that different uh, as people, as women, as we are, that, that they were then. Um, I think a lot of us might have the idea that the past is very different and very boring. And what I was trying to do was focus on the things that we do the same. Mm. Um, actually, I heard a lovely quote recently. Uh, somebody, you know, the way uh, in the olden times, a, a rich woman would give her cast offs to her lady's maid. Mm -hmm. and wear those. It was only later Victorian times that servants started to wear the black with the little apron. And I came across somebody saying, I wonder did a mistress ever get jealous when she saw her maid wearing the clothes and look better than her? Uh, yeah. And that never occurred to me, but it did. I know I've lent clothes to friends and been furious that they look so good in them. <laughs> so we're the same. And I wanted to try and show that to highlight things that we're the same. It's just yeah. technology has changed. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot, of, a lot of times women's voices would have been missing from history as well, because that, like even when Jane Austen's letters were found, I yeah. think, was it her brother that was saying, oh, there's nothing interesting in those? That's and right. like, it's Jane Austen, of course yeah. there is. But it was because there wasn't anything about wars. She was talking about Norman news, just daily life, which yeah. I think is very interesting. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're right about women's voices that they haven't been highlighted so much. I suppose history is, well, the term, isn't it? His story. Yeah. Um, in the victories. I, I want to do something with that, all right. Um, sorry, my cat has just come in. Oh, great. <laughs> Show in. Um, so what are you, usually when we work with visual artists, by the time they've put up an exhibition, whether it's on a website or on a wall, they're kind of done with it. You know, they're on to the next thing. So what are you working on right now? 
Well, um, I, want to, uh, I want to create a series of books. So I'm starting in 1780 where this dinner party is. And then the next one is in the Regency times. If anyone like Bridgerton, this shows how oh, Irish yeah. women lived during Bridgerton time and how they found a husband. Um, and then the next one was going to be set in the 1840s. And I think this one was going to be particularly interesting because um, in previous times, like the further back you get, there isn't that much information about how the kind of middle class or the poorer women lived. But as nearer we get to our timeline, we do start to get information. And I do have, I'm starting to get a lot of information about the likes of you and me. Well, sorry, maybe you. Oh. Uh, from the 1840s. So I'm now going to start to introduce a more normal Irish woman. Hmm. Uh, and I want to set that one in gardens, but with the idea of gardens as uh, places for growing food, places for growing medicine, but also for socialising. Um, mm. so I think that will, again, show kind of a, a snapshot of yeah. society in the 1840s. And usually when we think of the 1840s in Ireland, we think of a very poor Ireland and famine, um, but it, it depended on who you were. I suppose it did. Yeah. yeah. I'd love to do something about the famine, but I'm nervous. And I think everybody is nervous. The, the, mm. My style is kind of a bit jokey, as you said. Yeah. And I don't know if it's right for it. But yeah. in, maybe when I'm bigger and braver, I might approach it. Yeah, or it might evolve into a different voice. Yeah. As well. yeah like when yeah. you think of, I always think of Joseph O'Connor's Star of the Sea, kind of a really strong voices and real characters yeah um, so yeah. but and yet there was light-hearted moments in that as well so yeah it yeah. is possible mm. but in in cork because as you mentioned you know it was a big big port big trading port you, there was a lot of wealth moving through the city and the county yeah during the 1840s it was and the catholics were starting to come up now after the penal times and they yeah. were amassing their status and wealth yeah yeah and was there another book that you mentioned that you were Yes, I, I might get sidetracked from that whole 1841 um, because somebody suggested it could be a good idea to do the history of pandemics. Mm. And I think that could be very interesting just to trace, say, starting with leprosy in kind of very old Irish times. Um, I'm not, yeah. I think that's around about the 11th century or so, but nearly it's even, actually I'm getting confused, I have to do the research, but yeah. kind of leprosy, typhoid, cholera, syphilis, black plague, all these mm. things. And to do it in the same style about what you would eat, the medicine for it, how life was in those times, and then to compare it to how we're suffering now, mm -hmm. which show, again, it'll be another like a nice way of showing the journey of how time is passing and how progress is being made. Yeah, brilliant, yeah. looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to do it actually, particularly the old Irish times, I'm very interested in that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've not been before. Oh, there's so much to do, so much to I find know. out. So yeah, much right? to do, yeah. so little time. <laughs> Willy Wonka. Speaking of time, thank you for your time, Jenny. Um, and um, people want to click on the link, which will be with this video somehow through magic, um, to go onto the exhibition. And then there's a link in there into Jenny's kind of um, general website and a place where you can buy the books as well. Thank you, Jenny, so much. Thank you so much, Mabel. Pleasure.